Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to New Covenant Fellowship Church, where we have come expecting God to do great things, Amen. where we have come expecting him to move today, where we have come expecting him to have his way. Does anybody know that we serve a mighty God? Does anybody know that we serve a holy God? Does anybody know that we serve a faithful God? This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. So I invite you to stand to your feet and lift your voice as we sing about a mighty God, a holy God, a faithful God, a loving God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I can't hear y'all. Hallelujah. There we go. Help me out a little bit, all right? What a holy God! What a mighty 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 God! What a m
church choir, right? Y'all know I'm a church boy, so we gonna rock, all right? Y'all ready to rule? We're going this way, right here. There you go. an awesome God. Shout thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Because there's no one else like him. No one else can save our souls. No one else can heal our bodies. No one else can be the God of all. <laughs> so we thank you for being God. We thank you for being the King of kings, and we thank you for being the Lord of lords. Hallelujah. Who else could help the water? Save the whole world, no one could die and give his life as a sacrifice. Who else can heal the blind man? Who else could do it all again? No one could set the captives free, give us victory. There is no one like you. Thirst of high, thirst 
to search and search and search, but I've come to find out that there is nobody like our God. Hallelujah. We thank you for being God. We thank you for being the King of kings. We thank you for being the Lord of lords. We search all over. Nobody. Nobody. Hallelujah. been made. It's none like him. This week, Melissa and I were out of, or last week we were out of town and we listened to the message. So thankful for that app and being able to hear it. There's an interesting thought. Jesus said, or God told the children of Israel, because you're afraid of the giant. That was their excuse, right? There's giants in the land. And he says, because you don't have faith, you're not going to enter my rest. And I've been thinking about that and tying it together with that song. And here, here's the thing. What is it with a giant? Why are we afraid of giants? Well, because a giant can control me, and a giant can also kill me, right? They're bigger than I am. They're more powerful than I am. Everything's big about them, and so they can kill me. They can control me, tell me what to do, force me to do what they want, right? Do we have some giants? And that's where God is telling us we've got these giants and we keep looking at these giants. Oh, that can't be fixed. That's a problem that can't be fixed. Oh, that's an issue. Oh, he's too far gone. He, she's too far. I've got sin. I'm a sinner. 
I can't do. I, on and on and on, we just keep building these giants. And God wants to give us rest. And you know how we know? We know beyond a shadow of a doubt He wants to give us rest. He sent His Son to die. Even my sin, even the fact that I can't get it right is not big enough to stop what God is doing. Is it not incredible? I, there's one more example, and I, I'm, forgive me, Pastor, I, I'm, I feel like preaching this morning because you, you, look, at, you look at Moses and Haggai, or, or uh, Hezekiah. They both prayed that God wouldn't destroy Israel because they were so bad. God said, you know, I'm just going to wipe them. He said, no, for your glory. Why did, he, why did they both ask for, for his glory? Is because God has the power. God has the power, and Hezekiah and Moses wanted the world to see it, to take a bunch of rotten children like me and make something beautiful out of it. And that's what the cross is all about. Is that not phenomenal? That should set you free this morning. That's how, that's why this music is all about praising him for what he can do. It's so amazing. I was just thrilled sitting here thinking, whoa, this is really big, right? No giants, and I can rest. So whatever's causing you not to rest this morning, I don't know what it is. I've got mine. You've got yours. My goodness. Take Caleb's position, Joshua's position. Say, yeah, that's a giant. He's bigger. And let's pray this morning. Let's give it to him. Give that giant to him this morning because you know what? He's got something else for us he wants to hear this week through the pastor's message. And I can't hear it if I'm thinking about my giant. Right? Let's get rid of that thing. Okay? Go with me this morning. Father, thank you. Thank you for giving us rest. Thank you for offering us rest. If we'll just look at you instead of those silly giants. Oh, they're big, they're ugly, they're powerful, and they're scary. But they're not like you. They don't even come close. And we stand at the foot of those giants and they look so big, we need to back up and say, you know what, look at that mountain, that universe behind that little puny giant. And we need to praise you and thank you and rest in you. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Now, give us the strength to see you so we can hear what pa what you've given pastor this week because we're going to go out next week and face more giants and that you're not going to whip that giant like we think you're going to whip that giant and we get scared again so you have a message for us from for, through the pastor this morning prepare our hearts for it help us father help us because we're weak and we get scared. And thank you for your patience. Thank you for sending your son so that all those giants he had to bear on the cross to, so that I don't have to bear them. I don't have to fight those giants. You'll do it for me. Thank you. In your name I pray. Amen.
fucking rage up. Unspeakable, speakable. Don't mean it's unreachable. this for y'all. Lately, I've had a hard time, ain't been satisfied when I testify. Wanna make sure I'm sharp when I make the point of view.
Erica Campbell had a song out. I love God. You don't love God? Well, won't you? <laughs> so let me ask you, how much do you love God? Do you love God this much? Do you love God this much? Uh, this much? How much do you love God? Do you love him enough to die to your ways of living and live for his ways? Let me show you how much God loves you. Y'all may love him like this. God loves you like this. He loved you on a wood tree called the cross. He loved you so much that he was willing to die for you. That's how much he loved you. Now I ask you again, how much do you love God? You say you love God. But do you love him so much or enough that you would sacrifice everything you have just to grow closer to him? You would just, hey, I'm throwing caution to the wind. This is my God. I love him so much. There is um, there's a phrase. There is no greater love than this. There's no greater love than knowing that Jesus loves you to death. L-Y-T-D. That means to care about someone in a very special way. That means you love someone very strongly. You have very strong affections for that particular person. He loved you enough to sacrifice his life on the cross. Jesus is the ultimate and the first ride or die friend. He loved you enough to be taken all the way to the cross, and he died for you. He said this very important thing. He said in John uh, chapter 12, he says, unless this grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it will abide alone. And after a grain dies, you know what happens? If you go back, you'll see that it's sprouting life. It goes into the ground, buried, but then sooner or later you'll see something green pop up out of the soil, letting you know that what went into the ground to die is now resurrecting itself. It is now living, even though it died. Wheat makes bread. And Jesus also likened himself to the bread of life that fed the 5,000 in the wilderness when Moses asked God to feed the people. But the bread he gives in John, it says he gives his flesh. And people were saying, oh, he's a cannibal. He's preaching cannibalism. You can't eat the flesh. And, and, and they didn't realize that Jesus was speaking a spiritual truth using some illustrations that they could understand. Now, the bread he gives is his flesh, and John says that he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides or lives in me and I in him. I mentioned that up front because we're going to have communion after, uh, after I, I finish today, and if you want to go get your bread and get your juice, whatever you got, uh, uh, well, uh, I, I pray that it's, it's uh, uh, well, whatever you want to drink. <laughs> That's your house. I ain't in your business. <laughs> whatever you want to take and drink, that's your business. <laughs> Jesus also said he was the living water and the true bread. Now, eating and drinking his flesh was just a way of saying, believing in him for eternal life. Because he says, 
my bread is eternal life. And so if you eat his bread, meaning, you know, symbolism here, my flesh as an illustration, then you'll have eternal life. Now, when I confessed my sins and repented, I was sorry for my sins, and that's when I asked Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. And he became my Savior. And I was then justified because of my faith in Christ. Justified means to be declared right with God because of your confession and your repentance uh, uh, and, and, and you're willing to admit that you have sinned. Now, there are some people that leave the sin part of it out because they want to give you a, a, a nice feeling about their message and they don't want you to, they don't want to tell you that you sin. But the Bible says that you have sinned. So I'm going to stay right here where the Bible is. And if you want to feel good about your sin, that's, that's your thing. But uh, unless you understand how, how grave sin is and what Christ did for you because of your sin and my sin, then you probably think differently of it. But I, I'm going to just give you what the Word says. And, and, and so I repented and confessed and admitted that I was a sinner and I was sorry for, for my sin. Now, the greatest sin of all is rejecting Jesus Christ. That's the sin that sends you to hell. That's it. You say, what? That's it. But I've done this and I've done that. That's fine. That's not keeping you out of heaven itself. What's keeping you out of heaven is your having rejected Jesus Christ as the only means and way to get into heaven. See, because when you accept him and confess that you've sinned and repent of your sins, then that's when what Jesus did on the cross is applied to your life, and then all the things that you are guilty of, he wipes it clean. And then he writes your name in the book of life. And there's nothing besides your name that's in the past except the fact that you receive Jesus Christ. If you don't receive him, there's no other way for you to get into heaven. You can try some good works, and you'll work yourself silly and still miss the door a mile wide. The love of God was poured into my heart at that moment, and the Holy Spirit came in and filled me with love, and I started loving people that I didn't think I'd ever love. There's some people in my family I thought I'd never love, and I got saved and realized I'm loving these people. My cousins, man, I tell you. <laughs> Now, you may say, Pastor, how in the world can you love a God that you can't see? Well, I'm glad you asked me that. I'm going to use a natural necessity to make a spiritual point like Jesus did. First of all, faith is like Wi-Fi. It's invisible, but it has the power to connect you to what you need. My faith in God, in Jesus Christ, connected me to the power of God's love and the power of the Holy Spirit. And now, I've never seen them. But when I walk out these doors and I look into the heavens, and then I look on the earth and see all that's been created, I know that no person or no accident created all of these intricacies on the earth. In fact, Romans 1 says, you don't have to believe that there is no God. The heavens are already testifying against you. I mean, every plant groans to be redeemed. Why would they groan to be redeemed? Because they know there is a redeemer. And they know that there's going to be a new earth and a new heaven, and God is going to create all things new. And if you don't believe that, then you know you're dumber than a rock. But even the rocks have enough sense to cry out. Jesus said, if you don't praise me, the rocks will cry out. So the rocks are crying out, and you can't even testify with your mouth that there is a God. That's dumb. 
That's real dumb. My faith in God connected me to the power of God and God's love. But no one can fully understand or comprehend or even appreciate the power of God, the, the, the sacrifice of God, the cost of Jesus' love, unless you really understand what Paul was trying to pray for us in Ephesians. He says, I'm praying for you. I'm praying that you would be rooted and grounded in love so that you would have power to grasp how wide and, and how long and, and how high and how deep the love of God is. Last week I said, if you have a love problem, you have a trust problem. Because how can you trust someone you don't love? And how can you fall in, in love with someone that you haven't gotten to know? So I've gotten to know God over these years, and day by day, moment by moment, I learned something more about my God. I have never stopped learning. The day I, this professor told me, he said, the day you stop learning is the day you lose your right to lead because nobody's going to follow a dummy. You have got to always be learning because nobody knows everything. And somebody who's never graduated can tell you something about life. I found that out. When I talked to someone, I thought, I, you know, when I was first saved, I thought I was so this, that, and the other. And this little kid came up and said something that was so profound to me. And God said, you think you know something? Look at this kid. He's telling you something about me that you don't even have the faith to understand. And it was so profound. So now, but don't ever discount anyone. The Israelites were commanded by God to love him. He said, I want you to love me, and I don't want you to have any other God before me. He commanded them to love him with all of their heart and with all of their heart, all their heart, soul, and strength and mind. But they couldn't love God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength because they didn't trust God with all of their heart. So how can you love someone you don't trust? So until you trust God with all of your heart, you won't be able to love God with all of your heart because there's no trust in you for him, so there can't be any love in you for him. Love and trust are all connected, just in case you didn't know that. Ten times, I told you a couple of weeks ago, and we saw last week, ten times the Israelites tested God's faithfulness. But I want to give you another flip to that. God was also testing their faith in him. And I'm going to show you that today. I'm going to go through ten times. I'm going to get you out early, so don't, I'm going to talk fast, because my wife doesn't have to sign this week, and so, uh, so I'm going to talk fast. Y'all listen slow. <laughs> Every test that he gave was timed. Every test that he gave was necessary. Every test that they, that they encountered was distressing, but it was productive for some and destructive to others. Let me show you the very first test that God gave them. They were, they had just left Egypt, and God was their pillow of fire by night and cloud by day. So here they are, and right in front of them is the Red Sea. Behind them, they hear the hoofs of the horses of Pharaoh's army coming. So now they are frightened. They are sandwiched in between Pharaoh's army and the Red Sea. But God is their cloud by day and their pillar of fire by night. By night. He's with them, but they are afraid of the Egyptians that God delivered them from. I don't understand that, but let me show you something. Exodus 14 Verse 11, it says, Then they said to Moses, Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us 
a way to die in the wilderness? This is a repeated claim of the Israelites. Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Because you were enslaved and you cried out to the Lord because you were being mistreated. But anyway, is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt saying, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? You were in bondage, dummy. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, now I want you to, this is the first time that Moses has to put them in check and I want you to see what he's saying to them because this needs to be taken every test, in every test, but they don't take it. Moses says to them, do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. Why? The Lord will fight for you while you keep your big mouth shut. That's just my interpretation. What is he saying? The Lord's going to fight for you. What is he saying? You don't need to fear the Egyptians who are coming after you. So what are you supposed to do? Well, I want to ask you this. Are you between a rock and a hard place? Are you between a Red Sea and Pharaoh's army? Are you afraid of what's coming behind you and what you are facing in front of you? Well, if you are, I want to tell you this. God can drown your fears just like he drowned the, the Pharaoh's army when they came after the Israelites in the Red Sea. After they crossed over on dry land, what happened? They crossed over on dry land, and as they crossed, the Red Sea was a heap. In other words, it was congealed. I don't know how God did that, but the Bible says it was congealed, which meant that it was like jello, but it was stiffer. And they walked across on dry land. How do you dry the sea? Only God can. How do you congeal the sea? Only God can. So what is your fear? God is saying, give it, give it to me and I'll put it to death. Whatever it is that you are fearing, it has to bow its knee to me. Whatever it is that is keeping you up at night, God is saying, I will fight for you if you stop fearing me and complaining about Pharaoh's army behind you. The second time came three days later. Three days later, they complained about the bitter water, Exodus 15. Then he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed Moses a tree, and he threw it into the waters, and the waters became sweet. There he made for them a statute and regulations, and there he, God, tested them. And he said, if you will give earnest heed to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have put on the Egyptians. Why? For I, the Lord, am your healer. Then they came to Elam, where there were 12, look at this, if, if they had just waited, they were, on their, they, they were on their way to Elam. If they had waited and had faith, they would have had something to rejoice about. But then they came to Elam where there were 12 springs of water. God had a spring of water for every tribe leader. There are 12 tribes, 12 springs of water. All right, my group, come on over here. We got this spring for us. No, they didn't have that kind of faith. And 70 date palms, they even had something to chew on. And they camped there beside the waters. And I thought about that, and I'm saying, what is God saying to us? God is saying, 
if you would just be patient, I'm going to lead you to where I provided something specifically to satisfy your need. I know what you need. I'm your God. Will you just trust me and follow my ways? But they didn't. When the message of, of God spoke to me in this, it was just am, am amazing what God was showing me through all of these things. And, and the next, the, 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 two months later, two months later, they grumbled because there is no meat. They also, well, let me go back. They also grumbled because they didn't trust in God. And, and, and so, and, 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 and so here it is in chapter, the next, the next verse. Constance says, the sons of Israel said to them, would that we, again, had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt when we sat by the pots of meat. Two months later, they're grumbling again because there's no meat. But they had grumbled before that because it got to some bitter waters in Exodus chapter 15 and verse 25. They had come to some bitter waters, and you know what God told them? He, he told Moses, throw this stick in the bitter waters and watch what happens. Well, he threw the stick in the bitter waters, and guess what happened? The bitter waters turned sweet. And you know what I got out of that? God says to me, if you throw the message of the wooded cross into your bitter life, I can turn your bitterness into sweetness. But it only comes through the fact that you recognize that there's only one who's sweet I know. There's only one who can turn your bitterness into sweet. There's only one that can turn your bitter waters into sweet waters enough to drink because he is the living waters. And Jesus said, if you drink this water, you'll never thirst again. And the woman said, I want that water. <laughs> but two months later, it's not about the water. Now it's about not having any meat. Chapter 16, he says, when, when, when we ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into the wilderness, this wilderness, to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them. Notice he's testing them whether or not they will walk in my instructions. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. Moses said this, said, uh, Moses said, this will happen when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and bread to the full in the morning for the Lord hears your grumblings, which you grumble against him. And what, you, uh, and what are we? Your, your grumblings are against us, uh, not against us, but against God. And so you need some meat? Yes, I can give you some meat. What do you need? You know, this person, I, I told you the story before. This person said they were hungry, and so I was going to give him my, my happy meal. And the person said, well, is a hamburger in there? I said, yeah. Uh, I don't eat meat. I said, well, you ain't hungry. <laughs> Man, I'm telling you, huh? I mean, I've seen some people dumpster dive. Yes, sir. Go behind the, the dumpster in one of these restaurants, and they do a hunt. They don't care how, how, if it's contaminated or not. When you are hungry, you eat. You find something to eat, just dust it off, whatever it is. I mean, you eat, whatever it is. I mean, you, know, you, 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 you people tickle me. If you're hungry, you're going to eat. The man won't work. 
neither shall he eat. The fourth time, they gathered more food than God had commanded them. Exodus 16, verse 13. So it came about at evening that the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew evaporated, behold, on the surface of the wilderness, there was a fine flake-like thing, fine as the frost on the ground. When the sons of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is this? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it every man as much as he should eat. You, you shall take an omer, a piece, according to the number of persons each of you has in his tent. The sons of Israel did so, and some gathered much and some little. When they measured it with an omer, he who had gathered much had no excess, and he who had gathered little had no lack. Every man gathered as much as he should eat. Moses said to them, let no man leave any of it until morning. But they did not listen to Moses, and some left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and became foul, and Moses was angry with them. They failed another test. They tried to collect manna on the seventh day, Exodus 16, 27. It came about on the seventh day that some of the people went out to gather, but they found none. Then the Lord said to Moses, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my instructions? See, the people has given you the Sabbath. See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, he gives you bread for two days on the sixth day. Remain every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Now, you would think that the folks would have learned something by now, but they haven't. They complained because of the lack of water again. Exodus 17, therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water that we may drink. Did you not remember that God is the one who gave you water before, made the bitter water sweet? Can't y'all understand that God has, he, he has authority over everything that he has created? I mean, he, but they complained to again, give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and they grumbled against Moses and said, why now have you brought us up from Egypt? There they go, that same refrain, to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst. So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do with this people? A little more, and they will stone me. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pass before the people, and take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand your staff, with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, and the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Now, he hit the rock, water came out, and he did what God told him to do. The seventh time, they grew impatient when Moses was getting the Ten Commandments. So they told Aaron, Aaron, we don't know where Moses is. Oh, you know where he is, up on the mountain. Why don't you uh, make us a golden calf that we may worship and we can, we can give him credit for, for, for leading us out of Egypt? Well, they did that. Exodus chapter 32, verse 7. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, go down at once, for your people, <laughs> who
whom you brought up from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. God pleaded destiny on Moses. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, they are an obstinate people. Now then, let me alone, that my anger may burn against them, and that I may destroy them, and I will make you a great nation. It came about as soon as Moses came near the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses, his anger burned. And he threw the tablets. Now, let me stop here. Everybody think God is old-fashioned. God is the first one that made tablets. <laughs> Steve Jobs ain't got nothing on God. Huh? And see, Moses didn't even have to worry about doing a search. He didn't have to type nothing in his tablet. God did all the typing for him. He filled up the tablet. And he needed another tablet. Because when God was writing, God said, I need another tablet. So he made another tablet. And Moses brought both of them tablets down. Y'all think y'all so highfalutin in, in the 23rd century. Well, the 21st century. <laughs> you know, yeah, I got a tablet. I got an iPhone. You know, I can do that. God says, you know, I was around before Wi-Fi. <laughs> I even made tablets before tablets were e even fashionable. <laughs> Now he made, he threw the tablets from his hands and shattered them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf which they had made and burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it over the surface of the water and made the sons of Israel drink. Some people think that the grounding of the, the, the gold and all that stuff was, was for medicinal purposes or whatever, and I don't know why they grounded it, and I don't know why they had to drink it, but whatever it was, God had a purpose. Then Moses said to Aaron, what did this people do to you that you have brought such a sin upon them? There's some people that we hang around that get us to do stuff, that we know is wrong and it's a great sin on us because of them but know this God will take care of them whoever leads any of his children astray God will take care of them you don't have to worry about vengeance vengeance is mine says the Lord you don't have to worry about trying to get back at them God just give it to him now after using God's gifts for him, uh, no, the question is, are you using God's gifts that he's given you for yourself? That's really the question. See, God has given y'all a lot. Y'all know y'all got a lot. Just, just, just go look in the closet. How many times have you worn that one particular item? How long has it been sitting in there? You know, has it been rotating? If you haven't worn that thing in a year or two or whatever, it's going to rot. You, meet, you need to maybe find somebody to give it to before it goes bad. You know, I, 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 I told my wife, my wife laughed at me when I followed this, and I laugh at myself now when I think about it. You know, I bought this mohair sweater. It was so soft. It was so pretty. <laughs> it was gray and beige. Man, that thing was nice. I let this girl talk me into buying it just because I want to show off. She said, wow, that's a nice sweater. Huh, that probably looked nice on you. I said, yeah, it probably would. I looked at that price, $800. I said, I ain't buying this thing to myself. And she said, why don't you go ahead and buy it? You're the vice president. I bought that thing. Do you know 
that the moss got to that thing? <laughs> Ate that thing up. I was going to wear it one day to impress Madeline. Never did. I mean, holes everywhere. I could have worn it and said, well, I'm holy. <laughs> and I would have been literally holy. I was dumb, eat up with pride, and dumb, and dumb, and dumb. Are you allowing someone to cause you to sin? The, 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 the eighth temptation, or the eighth test. They complained again, and fire from God burned some of them. Numbers 11. Verse 1, now the people be, uh, became like those who complain of adversity in the hearing of the Lord. And when the Lord heard it, his anger kindled. And the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some of, the, some of, some of, of them at the outskirts of the camp. The people, therefore, cried out to Moses, and Moses prayed to the Lord, and the fire died out. <sighs> Number nine, they wanted meat to eat, not just manna. Number is 11 and verse 4. The rabble, this is a group of people that came out of Egypt with them. These were not necessarily uh, 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 um, Israelites. These were mixed people, Egyptians, some of them, or whatever, but they were not Jews. They were called the rabble. So there's a rabble among all of us in, our, in, 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 in every situation. There, there's somebody who's not a believer. So the, so, so the rabble who were among them had greedy desires. And also the sons of Israel wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? The same God that gave you quail. We remember the fish which we used to eat free in Egypt the cucumbers, and the melons, and the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic. Bad breath. They remember all that stuff. But now our appetite is gone. There is nothing at all to look at except this manna. Say to the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow you shall eat meat. For you have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Oh, that someone would give us meat to eat. For we were well off in Egypt when we were enslaved. Isn't that, why do we walk around with a slave mentality even though we've been set free by the blood of the Lamb? We still walk around as if we are still in sin. Well, you know, I'm still a wretched thing. I just don't know. You know, I got it. Oh, yeah. For we were well off in Egypt. Really, you were well off in sin. Therefore, the Lord will give you meat and you will eat. You shall eat. You shall eat not one day, not two days, not five days, nor 10 days, nor 20 days, but a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you because you have rejected the Lord who is among you. You forgot, and I gave you quail when you wanted some meat, and you weren't satisfied. Don't you know I can give you meat? I gave you bread. You complain about the manna. Isn't that just like us? Just think about it. God has done so many great things for us, and what do we do? We complain. As soon as we go through a test, oh, God, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. How did you get out of the last one? The same God that you prayed to then is the same God that's available now. You can come and pray to me. I'll take you, I'll, I'll take you through this whole thing. And they wept before him, saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? But Moses said, the people among whom, now here's his lack of faith. The people among whom I am are 600,000 on foot. Yet you have said, I will give them meat 
so that they may eat for a whole month? Should flocks and herds be, be slaughtered for them to be sufficient for them? Or should all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to be sufficient for them? What lack of faith. The Lord said to Moses, is the Lord's power limited? Remember when Peter and the disciples saw Jesus, well, when Jesus first met them and they had been fishing all night, and Jesus said, ah, you've been fishing all night? Yeah. He said, well, can you push out, you know, onto the lake? He said, ah, a little bit. And he said, um, and, uh, and, and you, 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 you and throw your nets over and, and you'll you, you catch something. Peter looked at them and said, wait, we've been fishing all night. We, 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 you know, in other words, we're good at this. Okay, you're a carpenter, but we are good at fishing. But they went out anyway. What they do, they threw the net over on the side. And what happened? The, 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 the net was so full that they had to call for help. I mean, this is the God that created the earth. Can he not create some fish in the water if he wanted to? This is the God that created the universe. If he wants to create another planet, can he not do that? If he owns uh, the cattle on a thousand hills, can he make some cattle appear that weren't there? I mean, he created everything. He can speak it into existence. So God says, uh, Moses, now I've been with you a long while. Now, is the Lord's power limited? Now I ask you, whatever it is that you need God for, whatever you need him to perform in your life, you think you don't, you think you, 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 you think you got to do that? No, you depend on him and his power. Folks, we can't do everything, and God never intended for us to do everything. It is God at work in us both to will and to do for his good pleasure, and God is going to take care of everything that we need because that's what the Word says. God has blessed us with everything we need for life and godliness. So if we need something for life, God says, ask me. I'll give it to you, but ask in faith. Now you shall see whether my word will come true for you or not, Moses. Hmm. Did it come true? Of course it did. God is trying to teach us something too. He wants us to know, look, whatever it is that you're depending on, God is saying, I am the one and the only one that will be able to do it for you. God, the, 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 the ninth test, they wanted meat and manna and all that, and then... The tenth test is when we saw, is what we saw last week. Last week, God says, you have tested me these ten times because you didn't believe that I had the power to bring you into the promised land. Now, the ten tests were timed. They were necessary. They were distressing. But each time, God showed them that they could trust him to provide every thing that they needed. Everything that they needed, God would provide for them. Now, the, the number 10 is a perfect number. It means completeness. And in the ninth test, they complained about not having manna. What they didn't understand was in that test, that manna pointed to Jesus because after Jesus had fed the 5,000, he left the disciples to go up to the mountain and pray, and the people that had eaten the, the, the fish and, and the bread, they searched for him all night long. And so he came down from the mountain, and he finally returns, and in, in John 6, it says, Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also, which I will give for the life of the world, is my flesh. And so what God is saying they ate manna and they died. But I'm going to give you the bread, which is the bread of life, and when you eat this bread, 
you are going to live. Jesus' bread is the bread of life. He sacrificed it at, get this, the ninth hour. Nine symbolizes completion of his work that his father wanted him to do, and his work on the cross at the ninth hour satisfied God's judgment, and his work was finished at the ninth hour of the day. Okay, let me explain it some more. That's when he showed us at the ninth hour, God loves us to death. Mark chapter 15. It was the third hour of the day. The third hour of the day, let me explain this to you, was the hour for morning sacrifices. So now, the third hour of the day when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. They crucified, uh, he, they crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. When the sixth hour came, darkness fell over the whole earth, whole land. Let me, let me stop there. The number six is the number for man. Man was created on the sixth day. But the number six implies this. It implies or symbolizes man's trust in his own powers and believing that he can get along without God's help. So darkness fell over the whole land. The number six is also connected to Noah, who at the age of 600 saw God put him into the ark and darkness fell over the world, over the earth, and it flooded because wickedness, the wickedness of men was so wretched on the earth that God wiped them out. So the sixth hour here is very important. It shows us that God was on the cross because of the darkness that fell over man when Adam sinned against God. So darkness fell over the whole earth until the ninth hour. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eloi, Lama, Sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus uttered a loud cry, and the cry that he uttered was, It is finished. The word finished means it's completed. It's done. And he breathed his last. Now, at the ninth hour, which means finality and completeness, Jesus gave up his spirit because his work was done. After the ninth hour, there was a loud cry before he gave up his spirit, when he said, it is finished, it was at the ninth hour. And he's saying, everything is completed. So that now he completed everything so that those who are in him can be completed and not lack anything because of him. So you are complete in Christ who completed everything by dying on the cross in our place for our sins so that we could have a relationship with God Almighty. Do you not understand how important that is? There is nothing that you can do to get closer than Jesus brought you to God. You are as close as you're ever going to get. All you got to do is walk in that reality. You are always in the Holy of Holies with God if you're in Christ Jesus, because that's where the blood was sprinkled over the, the holy seat in heaven. The blood never loses its power because God's blood was from God. It was alive. It doesn't need any preservatives. It didn't dry up. It's still in heaven, alive. And God ripped the veil in two, or the, or the veil was written to, from top to bottom, 
to signify that it wasn't man that tore it, but God, because no one could get up there to tear it. Because if they went into the Holy of Holies, they would die. So God ripped it so that we could now have access to him for all of eternity. He wants us to live in the Holy of Holies where all of our needs are met and his presence is, is there. He never wants us to live outside the Holy of Holies because inside the Holy of Holies is what is the Ark of the Covenant. Inside the Ark of the, of the Covenant is, is all that God has done throughout history. He gave us the tablets. But before you can get into the Ark, you've got to go through the mercy seat. See, you remove the mercy seat because under the mercy seat is the law. Are y'all with me? And then when you get to the Ten Commandments, God is saying, I got mercy on top of you. You can't satisfy the law. My son did it and the blood has not lost its power. Are y'all with me? And then he said, you see this stick that budded? What I'm trying to show you is with the stick that budded was that I can bring life out of dead things. And then you see this manna. What I want you to know is man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So that's all in the Holy of Holies. So if you want to see God's mercy, remain there mentally. Stop walking by the law and walk by grace and by faith. I can't satisfy the law. I'm not perfect. But God did because he is perfect. I am complete in him, the Bible says. Jesus' death and resurrection gave us, get this, and I'm going to hasten along here. He gave us a nine-fold fruit of the Spirit so that we can be complete. He gave us the fruit of, he gave us the, the, spirit of, the, the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Do you tell me I can't control this? I just do this because my, my mama and my daddy, you know, they had this problem and I got the problem. I'm telling you the truth. God can deliver you from whatever problem you have. I'm a living witness. If you're going through a trial, it's a test designed to discipline you. God disciplines us like our parents disciplined us. They child trained us to, un to, to recognize when we're getting close to something dangerous. You go to the wall socket and your hands are wet. What do they do? Don't, don't, don't. No, no. So what do, you, what do you associate that wall socket with? A smack on the hand. Huh? You never forget that smack. And what God is saying, whenever you're going too far away from me, I'm going to smack your hand. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to throw a test in your life so that you'll come running back to me. I'm trying to child train you. And he's trying to show us what's lacking in our faith. So how should we respond to trials? And what should we know? Peter said, we should rejoice. <laughs> in, first, in first Peter chapter 1, verse 6, he said, rejoice. Rejoice, why? Because in the previous verses, he's saying, you are protected by the power of God, and you have been born again. You've been born again, and now you're protected by the power of God. So now rejoice, because... You've been born again and protected by the power of God. When I'm going through a trial, I know. Here's what you need to know about every test and trial. One, they are timed. Two, they are necessary. Three, they are distressing. Four, they are productive. You say, well, how, what is it producing? Well, James says, consider it all joy. My brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result. So that you may be perfect, that means perfect, spiritually, and complete, complete, lacking nothing. 
at all. The word test means to prove the genuineness of something. The test and trial, it's used to prove the genuineness of something. And in this case, it was to prove the genuineness of our faith in God. God says we can test the genuineness of his promises to us, but there's one time that we are allowed to test God. And it's in Malachi 3. He says, bring all your tithes, the whole tithe, into my storehouse so that there may be food in my house and test me in this, says the Lord of hosts, and see if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out so much blessing until it overflows. Let me tell y'all, I've lived this verse out. Early on when I got saved, I was giving to the Lord. When Uncle Sam was taking stuff from me, I was giving to the Lord. God has honored my faithfulness over all these years. He's been open up, opening up windows of heaven throughout the ministry, and I thank God for that. I thank God for using each one of you. Jesus' death on the cross proved his love. There is no greater love than this to know that Jesus' love, that Jesus loved you to death. Do you realize that? Whenever you think about Christ and his love for you, he loves you this much. He died on the cross, gave his life for you. He says, I know you say, I love you this much. I love you this much. He says, I love you this much. You may say, I love you this much. God, he says, no, you don't know how high my love is. You don't even know how wide my love is. You don't even know how deep my love is for you. But if you would put your faith in him today, God will come into your life and he'll change your life. Question is, do you love him to death? He loves you to death. Is he your right or die friend? Romans says, oh, no man, nothing but to love him. If, you, if you're born again, you ought to be loving. If you're not born again, you can't love. You can't love because you don't know where love comes from because the love of God is a spiritual thing. But if you're willing by faith to trust him with all of your heart, then God will place his love into your heart, and then you'll be able to love him with all the heart that you trust him with. Now, if you would, get the uh, little containers out uh, for communion and and we'll do that as we close today. The Apostle Paul talked about the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians. And he said this in 1 Corinthians. He said, For I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It's not very big to break, but just take it as it is. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Father, I thank you for the sacrifice that you made on our behalf. Thank you that we can come boldly to the throne of grace to find grace and mercy because we're always in the holy of holies. And we're always right there by the mercy seat. Help, help us to live our lives walking in your grace by faith, realizing that it's your mercy. Because of your mercy, we are not killed. <laughs> Because of your mercy, sometimes when we sin and we know better, your fire of anger doesn't come down on us because in the sixth hour, Jesus felt forsaken because at that point in his crucifixion, you could not be associated with the sin, but you did that to him so that you would never have to forsake us. So we don't live by, 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 by good works. We live by the works of Christ. And we thank you for the works of Christ that brought us into a fellowship with you. 
Now to him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. And every heart that loves Jesus, say amen. Would you stand where you are? And if there's anyone that wants to give their life to Christ today, would you step out wherever you are, come down, and someone will, will talk with you. And if you've never... Uh, unite it with us, and this is the day that God is asking you to unite with us. Why don't you come on down and let us talk to you about what it means to be a part of uh, a fellowship. I'd love to be a pastor. For those of you that are walking out, and, and make sure you go down the aisle, or go down the hall and get yourself some, uh, some food, rotisserie chicken today, and if you uh, want to hang around with us, be my guest, and uh, those of you who want to take something to someone you know in a nursing home or sick and shut in, uh, please, by all means, take them a little something and, uh, and let them know how much uh, you love them and care for them, and uh, they'll see by the, by the way that you brought them a little bit to eat. Thank God for each one of you. Thank you all for coming today. I appreciate and love each of you. I don't tell you all enough, but I really do. I really appreciate you. Appreciate your faithfulness to this ministry. Appreciate your, your love for God. And I just appreciate that, that you have a sense of humor. You don't mind me being crazy sometimes. <laughs> and I love you for that. God bless you. Have a great week.